decades, police departments in the black community have been as compatible as oil and water. Songs like Fuck the Police and Cop Killer, hip hop has long been the loudest, brashest, angriest voice of this tension. Yo, Dre, I got something to say. For years, the streets have buzzed with rumors that cops actively profile rappers. Cop Killer! We were parked in front of a club and the, the bouncers had parked us there. You know, they had cones, but then the cops decided they wanted to raid this particular club. As the cop was going through his harassment stuff, like, oh, let me do this, let me go that, let me check this, let me check that, get out of the car. I was like, why are you going through all this, man? Why, I mean, what's all this about? You know, like that, you know, this, he said, yeah, this is a problem. He said, well, you didn't feel that way when you was writing Cop Killer. I had uh, pulled over and double fall. I was waiting for somebody to catch up to me. And up behind me pulls a yellow taxi cab, a uh, red light flashing in the dash. And I was like, oh, hell no. The officer jumps out. He walks out, taps on the window. Did I roll out the window? He's like, hey, Tigger. I like, like, before, like, I mean, not like, he knew who I was before he got to the window. And I didn't know how that was. I never rolled out my window. My windows are tinted. They're dark. Da -da -da. So, Somehow they had prior information of my, I don't know, my tags, or they knew the car. The Noriega case, uh, the police say that they had an anonymous tip that there were guns in the car. Uh, basically, I think around Union Square, they pulled over the, the vehicle that they were driving in. Uh, there were about 20 to 25 cops with guns drawn, all pointing, of course, at Noriega and the vehicle. Basically, they dragged the guys out the car, threw them on the ground. They searched the car. They didn't find any weapons in the car whatsoever. They still arrested them and impounded the car. The, the very first night that I was getting Jay-Z out when he was accused of something well, he ultimately did not do, somebody showed up in the precinct and said to me, hey, I'm the uh, hip-hop cop, I'm on the what? One time I got pulled over for having a 
tail light that was out, and I knew it wasn't up. Dude, these guys were very cynical. You know, when they had me in the car, they said, oh yeah, they named all the rappers that they had locked up before. You know, trying to tell them, trying to tell me about them, and trying to make conversation about them, or get me to talk about them, and I was just like, I was on 105, told me to head level, man, and they would cross the street. So I sent these kids down there with an autograph, with an autograph documentary CD, and it said to the hip hop cops, "Fuck you." See the police, QD3, get them. They keep fucking following me all around fucking New York. Whenever I come through, man, as soon as I hop off the fucking plane, they, I see you motherfuckers, cause you see nobody running. Go ahead, go ahead, cause ain't nobody running. They gonna pull off as soon as they see you doing that. Oh, if you don't know that the Green Jackets is gang patrol, and Buddha know, because Buddha, motherfucker, I see you motherfuckers following me. Stop following me, man. I ain't doing shit. I was definitely, I could say, targeted. You know what I mean? I was profiled, because I was a young black male in a nice vehicle. I didn't pretty much violate no violations, no traffic violations to be pulled over for. You know what I mean? It just so happened that, you know, I was in a stolen car. Police be on my back. <laughs> the hip hop police know me real good. They be like, there you go. Search them. Why did this become front page? Why? Because he's a young black man and he's a rapper. Rap star. You see this? Now, if he wasn't a rapper, would he make front page? Hell no. They gon' follow and profile the hip hop artists because they know we get we get it hard, you know. Especially in the south, we get it hard. I guess they don't understand our, the way we dress and, the, and our style. You know, if you're successful, they pulling you over and searching you because they feel you have a gun. You know, I'm sure they got their eye on me. I'm, I'm, I'm positive. You know, they want to know exactly what I'm doing, who I'm dealing with, and things like that. It's just like Cointel Pro. It's, 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 you have to observe powerful people. Rappers are powerful people. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I speak to a million people. From this room where I make a record, I speak to a million people. That's power. They keep track of every young black man, every young black woman that's involved in this business. I think somebody, there's a, there's a master list somewhere that everybody in hip hop uh, has something. They have their, all their information. There's always this fantasy among Negroes that they're doing something that the big they is afraid of. You know, they don't want this out. They're not used to somebody saying whatever the fuck they want to say. It's their job. Their job. They've been assigned to the hip hop task force. <laughs> so now a guy like me has to have, you know, get checked now. Everybody just got to rest and say, I'm a rapper. <laughs> they say, yeah, well, you're coming with us. That shit don't save you no more. Before you can say, I'm a, I'm a rapper, they'd be like, all right, cool, where go to your show? I'm a rapper, what? Get your ass against the wall. When everybody comes and they put the full court press on you, then you want to say, oh, they got the rap police. It's no such thing as the rap police. There's no hard evidence to indicate that the police have targeted them in the hip hop community. This was true until a story broke in Miami. In March of 2004, the Miami Herald published a story showing a direct link between the police and hip-hop profiling. It all began when journalist Evelyn McDonald received an email. I got an email from a Miami Beach police officer who had read a profile I had done of local rap rapper Jackie O. So this is the email, and you know, it's, at first it, she doesn't identify herself. She says, I just, hi, I read your article issued on October 6, 2003. In the article you mentioned that Poe Entertainment, her record company, has an office in South Beach. Could you please supply me with the address? The reason I'm asking is that I collect intelligence on all current rappers and record companies in the South Beach area. Thank you for your cooperation in this matter. De Detective Rosa Regirella, Miami Beach Police Department. And, uh, you know, at that point I knew that this was the story. I knew this was a story that um, people had been trying to chase for years in New York. We didn't have a contact number for a record label, and, we, and I believe the email says something to the fact uh, that we, we don't, can't find their number and, and listed. If you have a number and a contact person, could you please share that with me? And we'll go ahead and, uh, and, uh, and get that information. We can contact them and call them. Well, then after that, I get the call about, do we have a hip-hop unit? There's nothing in the Jackie O article indicating that she was actively involved in any crimes, um, you know, anywhere, or certainly in, in Miami Beach. Um, and yet they wanted information on, on her label. 
you know, t- tell us what you think about the way I don't want to like, you know, oh, no, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. like I'm the vice president of the right. just, you know, I heard some stuff about that, not you know, let's say our name or anything like that. I mean, Wait a minute, do I need my lawyer here? After Anthony got the email, we, you know, we went, we, we checked it out, did some background stuff to figure out if it was really happening. And then we sort of took it to the chief and said, you know, we understand that you're sort of gathering information on some, on some local rappers and perhaps folks visiting town. Can we sit and talk about this? Eventually got an interview with an assistant police chief, uh, Chuck Press, who was very candid with us in the beginning about, yep, you know, he and another detective had gone up to New York. They were completely out of the loop with the hip hop industry. They had no idea who was who, who had beef with whom, and really wanted to sort of understand that. It was never a secret. In fact, in 2001, we said we sent detectives up there to meet with them. We have no secrets here. We're networking. We're learning as much as we can about the culture. What we understood from our investigation was that this was a mammoth sharing process, that New York was the sort of clearinghouse, as we'd always heard. And New York, New York had always had this rumor about there being some sort of thing happening where they were gathering data. The Miami Beach and Miami Police Department confirmed that for us. And that was where we also saw this binder. We'd always, the binder had been rumored, and he showed us the binder. The whole binder thing was very uh, almost, you know, funny and some sick way to watch, because it was a, yes, we have it, no, we don't, yes, we have it, no, we don't, yes, we have it, no, we don't. And um, of course, we know that they had it. The two journalists dug deeper into the activities of the Miami Police Departments. What they found wasn't pretty. They were getting information from hotels. Who was staying in hotels? He was clear on that. He knew what rappers were staying where, what clubs they were at, because they needed to know if Ja Rule was staying next to 50 Cent. They did not want to have what happened in, in Vegas or what happened in LA with Biggie and Tupac. And that was the goal. I believe they were very sincere trying to learn something about rappers. Um, from the recent development, it had grown from what I've read in the paper to go beyond that, their boundaries now. I think they have overstepped their boundaries. They were, uh, had actual uh, filming people like P. Diddy who would come into the airports and certain individuals. When you go to the point where you start putting them under surveillance. Memorial Day weekend, New York called them and told them what rappers were, you know, who was driving what, what the license plates were. And that is how they knew, they, they knew what cars to watch. And they had their officers out there on, on such a wide scope that they maintained the peace. There was an origin to this fear. On Memorial Day 2001, Rappers and thousands of their fans descended on Miami. Like everyone else, they'd come to party, but the police departments weren't prepared, and chaos ensued. Unbeknownst to us, there was an underground advertisement of Miami Beach going on for them to come to Miami Beach for the first hip-hop uh, convention. Nobody in the city knew this was coming. They made a correlation between Memorial Day and, 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 and crowd control issues and, and folks just acting out and getting drunk and acting rowdy like Spring Breakers do. And they moved that up a rage and, and, and went into a direction that fo- some folks said was questionable. So we took the uh, ball and we ran with it. We learned as much as we could about it, not only the good side, but the bad side. I think the one thing that New York forgot to tell them in the training sessions was don't tell the press about this. I think that like, somehow that was like the one lesson that was left off the, the agenda. Miami Beach police pointed the finger up north to the New York Police Department. Not only did they reveal who trained them, but they also spilled the beans on who'd given them that binder. Chief Press did say that he had, they got training from from a New York police detective who had since retired, but he couldn't remember his name. Derek Parker. Derek Parker. Derek Parker, the hip hop cop. Call him Officer Dickhead. I don't know him, but fuck him. I found Derek Parker pretty credible. Hip hop cop. Yes to the hip hop and no to the cop, and and, um, I find it amusing. No, I think he's a cop. No, no, he, he retired. retired. Oh, he, he is retired. Yeah. My name is Derek Parker. I'm the retired detective from the NYPD. I studied the rap in the hip hop squad.
um, Village Voice. Uh, we found him, at that point, Nicole and I um, had gotten hold of the binder from the Miami Beach Police Department. We had a copy of it, um, and we were analyzing its contents. And I kind of played coy with her. I mean, I was like, what are you talking about? And she was like, listen, I got the book. And I'm like, what book are you talking about? She's like, the one with the mug shots. <laughs> and I knew it when she had that book that she was dead serious about it, because she told me what was in it. And I was like, wow, how did you get the book? He was shocked to find out that they'd given us, that they'd shown us and given us the binder. I mean, not only does she have it, now everyone has it. Now they're in New York, in Miami, in Los Angeles. New York, we learned, uh, you know, from some of our, my, my cop sources, was very upset that this binder had gotten out. She asked me a few questions, and I told her basically, how did she get my name? And basically, she said I was given up. <laughs> by Miami. You know, he verified the whole training sessions, um, and he added some details. He said that he'd act he actually came down to Miami Beach initially. And we know you came down here with your boss, and you set up these roll calls and talked to these cops and talked to them. I said that was done for a reason, and that's the reason that we did come down. It was for a reason. He says he started this, you know, he was a one-man task force, it seemed, for years in New York. He set this whole thing in motion and is now actually on the other side, he's now security to a lot of these stars. And I love rap music. Rap music is, is the biggest thing going right now. Not for just me, for my nieces, my nephews, for everybody in the country. It's a, you said in the paper today, it's a $10 billion industry. If you talk about a hip hop cop, a guy who's gotten into the community, it's, it's Parker. Parker has gotten up next to the hip hop guys. He's realized what the situation is and recognized the racial quality of the police reaction to them. The Miami area police departments had admitted to everything. They'd been trained by the NYPD detective Parker, and they had the binder. There was just one problem. The NYPD flatly denied everything. A rap unit, Derek Parker's role in it, the existence of any binder. Eventually did, and it's probably the most forthcoming statement that they've ever said, which is um, that they do monitor uh, the music industry. And I, I mean, we haven't done a thorough investigation of this, but I have not found um, any um, folk rock task force or um, <laughs> doo wop task force, or you know. <laughs> to deny that he was involved with it, it's, it's almost impossible, you know, because I was actually his commanding officer when he was involved in these investigations. We, we found Derek Parker who says that's not the case. He says that Louis Animo, the former chief of department, you know, secretly anointed him as the hip hop cop. I was the responsible uh, uh, person for getting him into the intelligence division and uh, creating uh, that one man unit at that point to gather intelligence on uh, uh, violence and violent trends in the rap industry. So what's behind the NYPD's official stance of denial? I can't speak for the NYPD, but I believe that they're being so secretive because New York and New Yorkers are very sensitive to this issue. There have been other problems in New York with the treatment of black and Latino communities by police. The street crime unit here was very notorious. The NYPD rejected this film's numerous requests for an interview, but music mogul Russell Simmons approached New York Mayor Bloomberg for answers. The Mayor Bloomberg sent me a letter and said it's not true. And that's dis disheartening to me because he said that he was not aware of any profiling and he had looked into it and thanked me for my interest. The mayor knows everything. There's no way that he would even call up Kelly, Ray Kelly, and Ray Kelly would tell him that there's no unit profiling rappers. Mayor Bloomberg gives Police Commissioner Kelly great latitude in running the police department. And if he says he doesn't know about a rap intelligence unit, it's possible. Did Mayor Giuliani know about a rap intelligence unit? Of course. So who is Derek Parker? And what's his relationship to hip hop? This is like all the things I've done. Well, my career, one of the events was Jack the Rapper. This is me with some of my friends down there. Me and Heavy D, you know, Howard Hewitt. <laughs> this is China, I used to be with her at the WWF. Boys to Men, Tina Marie. This is me, this is me and the Fresh Prince, KRS-One. Evander Holyfield, Arthur Prysock, MC Light, Russell Simmons. This is a song I, I produced and I wrote, and I had this kid, James, 
he was like a singer. I told him I wanted him to sing the song, but I wrote this just about me meeting a girl on the train and stuff like that, and I had him sing the vocals exactly how I wrote it. Over you know? here is my grandfather. My grandfather was the uh, MC of the uh, Apollo Theater. His name was Willie Bryant. So my mother's family has been in entertainment. My uh, grandmother used to be a dancer on Broadway when she was younger. My father, his family's different. My father was more of a civil, ser civil service worker, so we all became cops you know, and correction officers. Everybody's in law enforcement. Yes, I'm proud that he got into the police force as well as the rest of my uh, kids got into the uh, police force. He's always told me to, to you know, make sure I get an education, make sure I always do well, and uh, make sure I always get a pension. <laughs> <laughs> now, he's still living at home. Do you ever have any issues with that? or? <laughs> <laughs> Derek's from the heart of Jamaica, Queens where the drug trade started. It's a, it's a fork in the road for Derek. It was, look, either go this way and hang out with the drug dealers, or go this way and go to school and be in the police department. So Derek made the right turn. I got into rap when I was in the police department. <laughs> the stuff that was going on in the music world when I was working. That's what brought me to it, and I knew this world already, because I knew how to produce music, I knew artists. I had been to all these different um, Places, all these gatherings, all these um, hip hop summits and, and music summits. So I knew everybody in the industry. So this is just something I really knew. I knew very well. Parker went on to achieve the highest rank as a detective, that of first grade, which marked him as one of the NYPD's most dedicated officers. We're driving past the old special projects team that I was on in Cold Case. We were based out of uh, 4951 Chamber Street, which is right here. I would say uh, during uh, the point where uh, Derek and I worked together, Derek probably solved above average amount of homicides in proportion to the other detectives in the squad. Since 1996, um, we were charged with the um, responsibility of investigating homicides that went unsolved in New York City. 96 to 99, I was over here. Like 96, I was in Brooklyn. And then towards like the end, I was on special projects because I was working on special homicide cases. Derek had that extraordinary ability to, uh, and for lack of a better term, I guess, smooth people, because we used to call him that as a nickname sometimes, the smooths. And um, he could sit with someone, and within several hours, he had the ability to cultivate someone to the point where they would be forthright with information and help us solve cases. I was one of the detectives that liked trials. I like going on trial because people always say don't match your wits with the attorneys, but sometimes you just wanted to. Because you wanted to see if he was good, if you were good. And then if you answered the right questions, and you didn't screw up. He was, uh, he was a very intelligent person. He, um, his capabilities as far as documenting things and prosecuting cases later on, uh, he was an expert witness in uh, testimony in court, uh, which is very important in a homicide case. Um, and he was, you know, he was just an excellent, excellent all-around detective. Derek will call you at 8 o'clock in the morning. Yo, Eric! Yo, one of your guys done pulled a stunt again. I said, what do you mean? Little buddy robbed a bank. Derek. Who the fuck is little buddy? <laughs> what do you rap guys? What do you rap guys? You're robbing banks now. You're moving up. I said, Derek, come on. I said, Derek, I ain't never heard of little buddy. Yes, you did. He's hot in the... Hold on, let me see where he's hot at. <laughs> in New Orleans. I said, Derek, come on. Man. There was uh, several cases that Derek had um, worked on during his course of his assignment with me in the cold case squad. Um, uh, the Biggie Smalls case, uh, as I recall, was one, the uh, Tupac Shakur case. This is Midtown North Precinct. I started here when I was a rookie cop working in the Midtown area. This is the place that I came to during a lot of the uh, rap-related incidents. Many times, I've been in this precinct so many times with the Steve Stout thing with Puffy. That was one of the toughest days I've ever had. And uh, my boss, Joe Pellini, shot me down so bad. I wanted to give up on doing this rap stuff. I was, just said, don't call me anymore. Because, you know, he didn't want me to go out and help the other commands, you know, because he wasn't getting anything out of it. And plus, I could see his point. They were taking one of his guys and using my talents to better them. Unfortunately, a short time after that, um, it sort of really smacked me in the face because now they took, they called me and they told me they were going to transfer Derek to the um, intelligence division. Detective Park was, you know, to me, an exceptional detective. Uh, we base everything that we do as commanders on clearance rate, and I knew that if they took him away from me, 
uh, my clearance rate would be substantially hurt. I would never have thought that. I would never have thought that I would have been involved in uh, all this hip hop stuff, all this rap related uh, stuff that was going on. Here we're at the uh, we're at the intelligence division. <laughs> this is basically like the home area we used to come to to, to come in and uh, basically just work. You know, it's, it's the headquarters where you all your paperwork, your computer center, you know, other detectives. You know, everybody would come in here and do all their work. You know, it's a big place as you can see because it it really stretches around the whole uh, entire area. This is the entrance into the. Uh, the Brooklyn Army Terminal, you know? How you doing? We're just going into the conference center. Thank you. Wow, I guess you see how easy it is to get in here. <laughs> and this is it. This is the front entrance of the intelligence division. Yep. This is, uh, of course, security security's on us now. We're looking. So now, you know. <laughs> yeah, I just told him we're doing it. I slow down to him, yeah. How you doing, buddy? They're just filming the thing for a bank. For the Commerce Bank? They're not allowed to film me now. They say permission. Okay. All right. Anyway, as you can see, this is a covert place. <laughs> But you can't film. What's the reason? What What was the the official reason given for starting such uh, a task force? Violence. Anytime a rapper gets shot or shoots someone else, it's big story in the paper. And so I would think, like the NYPD would almost be remiss if they didn't have someone watching it. You gotta remember back six years ago, it, the rap uh, music industry was in a, uh, a world with the violence. It ain't like right now I finish my record and I'll be like, come on, let's go drive with the niggas. That ain't how it happens, dog. It's the motherfuckers that ain't making records that are out wilding. Trust me. Last I heard, they hadn't solved the two pack or Biggie murders. So they're not trying to solve murders. You know, if anything, I think they got caught with their pants down a little bit when Biggie Smalls got killed and this whole thing was going to come back to Brooklyn and there was going to be this massive funeral and the NYPD didn't really know what the hell was going on. Our intention was basically to really monitor it and to report because you remember you had a lot of uh, different chiefs, a lot of different captains that weren't into rap. <laughs> they, all they did was rock and roll and some of them had this idea that the rap community was all bad. We had the rap artists as victims, in some cases, rap artists as uh, perpetrators of the violence. And a close friend of mine told me that there was a detective who worked in the New York City Police Department who had expertise in this area. After the crack epidemic sort of uh, slowed down, like it was in the, in the 80s, and then when the 90s came, it started slowing down, this music industry was like a new drug game. Everybody started to get into the music industry. It was my intention then to uh, rather than have Derek work on these cases ad hoc as the cases came up, to see if we couldn't find a place to put him, to institutionalize his knowledge. Chief Adamo wanted this to be, he wanted me to share a lot of the information I had because it would help a lot of the um, precincts and the other detective squads and the patrol officers understand and, and gain a little insight on the rap music industry. And, and now that you found out what's going on, <laughs> yeah, I was always doing police work. You know, I kind of, I sort of lived for it, so I was always doing police work all the time. Whether it was planning for the Biggie Smalls funeral in Brooklyn, where I know he, he had a hand and he helped us out immensely, or some of these other cases involving homicides and uh, shootings throughout the city during those years, he was an invaluable asset and one that I would invariably send detectives to. I wouldn't say I put my name on the arrest report, but I helped in assisting the squad with arresting them. Puffy was one. Screwball, old dirty bastard, little kid, junior mafia guys. Somebody had to step back and take a bigger look at what was going on. And that was Derek Parker's role. 
My job, my mission was to go out and to reduce the violence in any way possible. If I had to go out here to talk to these guys or let them know who I was or be at certain venues and try to prevent things, that's what it was all about. The role of the detective in, uh, in the intelligence division is to gather the facts, analyze them, make some recommendations, or tell people who need to know, this is what I see happening here. There was one of the chiefs that wrote a memo that every rap-related incident, they had to notify me. So while I was home at 2 in the morning or 3 in the morning, I had to get up and respond. If, if I wanted to get any rapper, I can go and find out what any rapper is at. Whether he's at a venue or he or she is at a house. I don't, you know, but it all depends where you're going to take them. You know, if there was a, a rapper that committed a certain crime, of course you're not going to go to a wedding reception and grab somebody. Although I did do that one time. You got to understand a little bit about the hip hop, hip hop community itself, you know? And I do, I understand these guys. That's why I talk with them. That's why, you know, I joke with them. That's why I'm able to go out here and do this and that. You know, I don't hang with everybody. I'm sure they don't want to hang with me 24 seven like that, you know? I don't think Derek has a great relationship with any rapper. I think rappers has come just to respect Derek that he does his job. Rappers is business. According to Parker, the unit used a full range of intelligence gathering methods. Going to different venues, yes. And following people to parties. Watching people, yes. Taking down their license plates numbers. And Surveillance, yes. Following them off of planes. Photographs, yes. Checking their itineraries when they stay in hotels. Looking at certain individuals, yes. Like a, a Russell Simmons um, to a Puff Daddy and all that kind of stuff. I just don't understand what sort of criminal activity that they expect them to be involved in as they're getting off of an airplane. I think that the idea of keeping people in the rap world under surveillance is a good idea. Because after all, it's the only area in popular entertainment in which people have been murdered. A lot of surveillance that I might have done, if it was articulated, maybe we do it a rap artist itself. But in most cases, it might have been a club. You know, you might you might have had a homicide, you might have had a shooting, and it might have been a different party with a different group of people, and you might have wanted to see who was coming back. Biggie Smalls back in the days, Biggie was surveilled. I think Puffy's been surveilled. Uh, Back but you know, the police department perceived him to be a problem back then. There was an event in New York where Snoop was coming to town. And there was word out of um, LA that Snoop had some beef here before in New York, and that uh, he was coming to New York to a particular club. Yeah, there was some surveillance done just to see if he was gonna show up or who was gonna travel with him. Because the thing was is that you don't want anything to happen here. You know, especially when we got the word that Suge was in town, or Suge Knight might have been in town. There's definitely a need for surveillance. <laughs> the rap unit didn't just run surveillance. It assisted other units in investigating crimes. Detective Parker was called in on a number of high-profile cases. We're in Midtown Manhattan. This is 43rd Street between Broadway and 6th. The Kit Kat Club that used to be here, I got a call here about a, um, a stabbing between uh, an individual named Lance Rivera, and uh, it was alleged that Jay-Z was the one that stabbed him. Apparently, Jay-Z and Lance had a dispute over um, Lance bootlegging some uh, of his CD that wasn't supposed to be out yet or out to the public, and uh, they had a dispute over it, and he was stabbed. So I came up here to assist the Midtown South Squad in the investigation. Uh, and subsequently, Jay-Z was arrested for it. And uh, after Jay-Z was arrested, he pled to a uh, lesser charge. This is Club New York. Back in 1999, I was called here for a dispute between Puffy and Scar. Apparently, Puffy was with J-Lo, and uh, they were coming into the club here to party. And apparently, this guy Scar got into a dispute with Puffy and Shine while they were in the club and threw some money in the air, supposedly at Puffy. Uh, <clears throat> subsequently, Shine was arrested because there were shots fired in the club, and he ran out with the firearm in his waistband. Puffy and J-Lo had took off, and they were stopped maybe a block or two up the ways, and they were brought back to the scene and then taken into the precinct. I was called about 3 a.m. in the morning, and I was told to get over to the precinct into Club New York and to uh, sort of spearhead the um, investigation for um, did the squad and patrol. 
This is Club Envy. Back a few years ago, when I was doing <clears throat> music in the hip-hop squad, I had to come here at 4 in the morning because there was a shooting involving an individual named Peanut, who was from Brooklyn. He was so-called loosely tied to the music industry, so he says. He apparently pulled up in a Range Rover in front of the club. He stopped to talk to someone. Someone walked up to his car, shot him. He took off up the street, ran into a tourist and killed the tourist. He died upon impact of the crash. As soon as that tourist got killed, that was a big deal, especially in Manhattan. I think the chief was very upset about a tourist just walking across the street and getting killed, coming out from a nightclub that dealt with hip hop. Yeah, so we're up in Harlem. I was up here for a few investigations uh, involving the hip hop community. Uh, some arrests, some shootings up here. Here's the Apollo Theater. I was up here a lot. This is the mecca of concerts up in Harlem. I think everybody performs here or everybody goes here at one time or another. This is where the Fuji's up, up on 125th Street is where the Fuji's had a big concert. And one thing led to another, and there was a, uh, a guy who had a gun in his hand and fired off a round, and everybody just started scattering all over the street. The work that Detective Parker did in the rap unit is on display in the infamous binder that the Miami Beach police handed over to the press. Hi, I guess you guys want one of these? Yeah. Don't, don't videotape, please. I'm not going to. Oh. Where did you get your thoughts on this book? Which book is that? Would you like to see it? You have the folder? <laughs> hey, yo! Hey, come prepare. This is it? Wow, am I in it? Let's see what we have here. Dun, 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 dun. That's crazy. That's got everybody's name and police rap sheets, and it's pretty big right here. Wow. Step back. Up. Yeah. It better not be your rap sheet, fell. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, I mean, this is typical intelligence stuff, where they give you photo and they give you pedigree information. And... Terrible. This is really terrible. They got the homie rule. Oh, shit. Hey, yo. <laughs> Nor Han Capone, we got our bio too. <laughs> Look, there goes JC. Mugshot profile, Jigga. That's cold. They got the Sean Combs they nigga looking like he's like, looking like he from motherfucking Africa. 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 Looking like he yeah. a bootlegger. Wow. <laughs> Who that? Oh. Wow. <laughs> Don't oh, say no, no. Here you go, right here. What? Damon Dash, nigga. Who's this? Oh shit, that's me. <laughs> they got Def Jam like it's a gang too, though. Right? Like if you ain't got no crew, they throw Def Jam there. Oh, they tell you what kind of vehicles they drive. I can't have no vehicles on me. Shit, no cap. Yeah, this borders on uh, criminal conduct. Despite the binder being out in the open, the NYPD has stuck doggedly to its denial. They're saying that stuff was compiled by an officer, a detective, who took it upon himself to take an interest in the rap industry. Actually, he was ordered to do it, but uh, I don't think he would have done it if the chief didn't tell him to do it. Commissioner Carrick stopped me in the street and told me that he wanted the binder done. And the chief was saying, like, listen, this is what we're going to do. They want this to be like a random clearinghouse publication where everybody can get it. And in the book, it contain rappers, their arrest histories, criminal histories, and a photograph. Anything that Detective Parker was doing was done uh, officially. He was officially assigned to gather information and intelligence. There's a, there's a chain of command and there's a letter that it has to be sent. It's called the who, what, why, where, and how on the police department. And uh, like I said, stuff like this has to be authorized. It can't be just done without me saying, okay, yeah, I'm gonna write this book and this is how I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna have this book here, especially it getting out like this. I am surprised that the New York City Police Department would deny knowledge of um, maintaining files on a particular group um, unless they had some sort of specific reason. If, as the authors of this material, they're the ones who would, could most ultimately be liable if it turned out that any of this information was gathered in violation of anyone's rights. And so they would be most likely to not want to admit this. 
So what's actually in the binder that would cause the NYPD to deny its existence and make organizations like the ACLU so concerned? The book that I made would gave a detail of certain rappers and their criminal histories, okay? Certain lyrics, certain other things were in there about things that happened, certain other people that were in the book. This is a, this is the thing I did. It just shows you that there's no foldable available because the phone is sealed. It says that on it. But it tells you a little bit about the guy's address, his date of birth, social security number, his last reported arrest, and his criminal history. Vehicles, Mercedes Benz is a car he may drive, his FBI number, and his NICET number, which is his police department number, NYPD number. This binder is basically just a, uh, it's a bunch of public records mug shots, if you will. If somebody comes to town like, like P. Diddy, we don't have a, a file on P. Diddy that we open up and learn where he lives. We know where he lives. We can go to his house right now. We also had an addendum to the binder, which is all the crimes that happened from 94 to present. And each of it spelled out which precinct it was in, which crimes were committed. And they were probably over 100 different various different crimes. We've got a comprehensive report here on Missy Elliott. And it's got the names that are associated with her and uh, um, whether there are any bankruptcies or tax liens or corporate affiliations, uh, driver's licenses, uh, any, uh, she have any merchant vessels, uh, motor vehicles registered. And uh, Missy is one of the people who is not listed in here and as far as I know doesn't have doesn't have a, a criminal record. The, the dossier also did complain, uh, did contain also reports of people who had made complaints about the police. There was a certain rapper who uh, entertained a young woman and woke up and she was gone and so was his money and, he, and that was in there. And problems that people have had with vehicles and things like that. So they gathered a whole lot of stuff including things that didn't have to do with crimes committed but also people who were victims. The obvious question about the binder is, how legal was it for the NYPD to make and maintain it? The book should be purged if, if the person who's in there has had the criminal charge expunged. This is obviously a mugshot. The case in which this was, um, was dismissed. The record should have been sealed and closed. Obviously, it wasn't. I handled that case myself. If I went and tried to get the all of the conviction and arrest records of, of uh, let's say, some of the uh, CEOs and Enron and Adelphi and WorldCom and some of those, I don't think there'd be a big binder that everyone's passing around that I could just go down there and get. The binder may seem to cross a legal line, but when it comes to surveillance, the NYPD has been governed by regulations like the Hanshu Agreement, established to prevent the misuse of police surveillance powers. That did not stop us from conducting criminal-related intelligence investigations. When we were compiling the, uh, the binder, um, the Hanshu law came into effect. But even if the rap unit didn't breach any surveillance laws, what about the act of compiling the binder? Is that a form of racial profiling? Oh, it's all black people? Well, it's mostly all black people in jail, too. How many white guys in this entire packet here? Not a single white guy, and you have thousands of black men. I mean, uh, I, was, I was looking for, I didn't see him and him in there. Uh, no, I, there aren't any. Heavy metal, smokes weed, smokes drugs, get drunk all night, rock bands, ah! and they bang the music and go crazy. Why the fuck they wasn't with them? Huh? The compiling is, in the, is, is the issue. Of course, now you've focused. Now you've defined the group. Why not defining them as Jews, or let's get the Muslims, or let me get the other groups? But that's sort of consistent in any area of organized crime. We have books on Chinese organized crime people where we have numerous photos. We have photos on numerous people that we gain intelligence on in traditional organized crime, non-traditional organized crime. They do have mafia folders. It is different. Mafia folders are persons whose sole purpose is to commit a crime, OK? These persons are ostensibly legitimate people who may have committed a misdemeanor or something. This is racist. Let's start where it is now. They're not doing this to rockers. They're not doing this to a lot of entertainment that may be considered on the edge. 
This is racist. This is playing to the fears of whites and some middle class blacks, and they're doing it at the expense of the civil liberties of these kids. Hey, hey how you doing? How you doing? Good. All right, King down at least. Let's see. What's going on? All right, you're the man of the hour now. We got a hold of the famous dossier. How would you describe the dossier? It basically it's a book that contains pictures and uh, names and criminal backgrounds of some of the people that are in the rap community. Want to take a look at it? Is everybody who is in here under some sort of suspicion? I don't know if you would say suspicion, but if you notice, they all have arrest records. Because these are all their arrests. Oh, right, but I asked, I, I didn't ask that because I read that. I said, okay. is everybody who's in here under suspicion for drugs or criminal activity? I couldn't say that. You have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. In many cases, it's the associates of rappers who are under investigation. And that's what got the rappers into the binder. You could look at the, the record labels and look at who's on them, the rosters, and what artists on record labels, but it's not just that, it's the, it's the artist itself, and it's probably the people, or maybe some of the people that they travel with, or affiliated with. They're, they're really looking for the arms you watch. You think so? Yeah. It seems like the hip hop task work might be probing more so of our entourage, and just affiliating the whole situation and making it just one issue that just ultimately becomes a stereotype or a stereotypical situation for the artist. Take the case of Fabulous. Fabulous was being surveilled, and then he wasn't. It wasn't like we did a big surveillance thing on him. We looked at a few things, and then that was it. Such as people he hung with, certain locations he frequented, uh, any other people that had different crimes that affiliated themselves with him. Certain things was going, like, you know, police were, being fo were following us around and, and, and stuff like that. And, and I had heard this buzz of, yo, they got some hip-hop cops, you know what I'm saying? Fabulous got pulled over twice, if you remember. It was two instances he got pulled over. One was the possession of the weapon. Number two is one of the other guys that was in the car with him was another guy who runs, who ran with Fabulous. There's a guy that uh, we investigated. His name was Rasharm Davis. And uh, I know that he is a questionable type guy, guns, assaults. At that time, Rara didn't even have a rap sheet. You know, Rara was, actually we had a clean slate, and he'd never been you know, arrested for any felonies. There was information that uh, there were guys going around in his group, particular group, that were going out there robbing other rappers. There were investigations with uh, a robbery involving Foxy Brown, uh, home invasion, and it was also a uh, another robbery with Buster Rhymes. There were people that were in your crew at one point you know, and I don't know what type of relationship you might have with these guys, but that they were doing robberies on other rappers. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of this before? I've never heard of this. We had information that some of his guys that traveled with him were doing robberies of other rappers, and they were taking chains and, and, and gold and things like that, and they were going to a jeweler, and they were getting the jeweler to melt down the, uh, the jewelry, and the jeweler was reselling it. There's a prominent Manhattan jeweler that's been fencing stolen jewelry. What do you know about that? I've never heard anything like that. When they took the jewelry to a guy who could get rid of the jewelry, he was involved in a murder in another state. So, and he was a prominent person. So that became a really big problem because now you have all these different units that want to get involved in this investigation. So that became like a problem. And, you know, the FBI had to go through a lot more paperwork. There was a lot of things that had to be done. And then eventually it just got Push to the side. I just think it's guilty before, you know what I'm saying? They're saying you're guilty before, and then you gotta prove that you're innocent. There were charges being considered against Fabulous at that time, and the investigation kind of stalled somewhat. These are the things that a lot of people don't know what's going on. Like a lot of people are very quick to judge, like, why do you have the hip hop police out here looking at certain people or following certain people? And it's because of things like this that happen. Some of these people in here were involved in criminal activity, whether it was in the past or, or, or whatever. Okay, but you got to draw the line because past is no longer reasonable suspicion. suspicion unless you're saying that the wait, unless you're saying the department is saying that once you've been convicted, then that gives you lifetime suspicion. Well, let, let's look at the lyrics, for example. If you say I make lyrics to say fuck the police or cop killer, 
You don't think the police are going to respond to that? Of course. But what, do, what do police have a right to do once they hear those lyrics? I'm not saying they're going to go out and just arrest you because you said lyrics. Well, what? What, what will they do? They probably going to. They probably said, "Well, this guy's saying fuck the cops." So he's out there. He hates cops. So am so, I going to? So because of that, we're going to do what? Pay attention to the lyrics. Okay. So you. So pay attention means what? Play the CD, listen to it, enjoy it. Uh, yeah, and listen, what? listen to his lyrics. Okay, and that's it. But right. then, but will they say? But you you can't do anything to that person. No, because, because of his that. lyrics. No, of course not. You okay. can't do anything to him. So when you were saying respond, you're talking about officers who are acting outside of you, what they're supposed to. How about who shot Rudy? Well, that was. <laughs> This group, Screwball, came up with a, a song, Who Shot Rudy? Who shot Rudy in broad daylight for cash? I woke up one morning and heard the news flash. <laughs> I heard it happen down the city hall. He had his wife with him. Five shots from the gun made him fall. And we basically wasn't trying to basically, like, target the man, like, to get killed or anything. It was just a song. There's one song from Kyron that he wrote when he in jail. He's mad at Giuliani, wrote a song. The track hit the streets during Diallo era in New York, at a time when Giuliani hating, especially on the part of the city's black community, was at an all-time high. One day I came into work, and I got a memo from my boss that I had to go out to Queens, Warrants, because uh, they were going to pick up Screwball, one of the members of the group. I caught the mayor's head because it was all over. Once we was on the newspaper, we was all on, all on Channel 5, Channel 2, 7, all the channels. They was all on us, you know, because of that one song. That was the first day Daily News probably went platinum in the hood that day. Because everybody was buying the news. I mean, I came out of the building, old ladies was telling me I'm in the newspaper. And I'm sure the mayor wasn't too pleased about it. And he wanted to find out who these guys were. The police came up to the record company and took all our songs to listen to our songs to hear if they was hate, hate crimes. And the reason we did check on them was because of their lyrics and the music. And uh, we did a background check, and it revealed one of them had an open warrant. The, the, the person who wrote the song, Karan, he, his, he, was, he, he had a PO, and his PO told him that his superior told him to go through his uh, record with a fine tooth comb. One of the treatments that uh, this guy got was the silent treatment after that. He got picked up by the police. They got arrested for a drug case that was later dismissed. Then he got arrested, I think, for another drug case that was also dismissed. He needed to appear in court and uh, a bench warrant gets issued. And actually, when he got the warrant, he's just going to be brought in front of a judge. The judge is going to make him pay the fine or whatever, and then release him. We didn't we didn't anticipate that 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 big response behind behind that. Nah. We well, sorry we said these bad things about Giuliani and tell them that it wasn't meant to, it was just meant to sell records, you know? The police talking to us on the siren and wait, um, flicking the lights. It's Ruball. Hey, what's up? They was on me, you know, hard, so throwing me in a van, driving me around for hours. But as I told the guy, you know, you can't just go out here and scream against the mayor and then have a warrant, you know, an open warrant. And so at what point are they looking at him just because they're pissed off at what they're writing? And at what point are they looking at him because it's legitimate to go out and arrest a guy who's got an open probation warrant. You know, it's coming that he said something against Giuliani, and of course it wasn't appreciated. That's really where he got picked up. Others could tell you, well, he had an open warrant on him, and that's why we picked him up. I'm not surprised that uh, Derek might have gotten an order to uh, look into someone who wrote a song that was uncomplimentary to, uh, to the mayor. Giuliani did not tolerate dissent very well. And uh, he'd do things sometimes out of uh, pique or anger that I think, uh, this is the mayor I'm talking about, that I think he probably regrets now. That was a bad song for those guys to make. Okay, <laughs> did they have a right to make it? Yeah, they did. Okay, did they have a right to be uh, arrested because they made the song? No, they didn't, but they, had, they got arrested because they had a warrant. Do they have a right to be investigated because they made the song? Uh, they probably shouldn't. I, I'm giving you my opinion now. And to me, I wouldn't have made a big deal of it, but someone did. Do you think the mayor and somebody didn't hear, like, who shot Rudy because it was getting all this publicity in the paper? You don't think the mayor opens up the Daily News or the Post and say, who shot Rudy? Who's this guy, you know? You don't think people are saying, like, these guys out here making a song about fuck Giuliani and uh, this and that, they're going to shoot him? Well, what what happened in the case like that? Are these guys really going to shoot Rudy Giuliani? 
I don't know. Maybe his thinking is that these guys are looking to shoot you, Mr. Mayor. You know what I'm saying? You're being know, arrested because you, you, I know you criticized the mayor. Right. And <laughs> as a result, we put a lot of power to somebody who could have been investigating some some serious rap murders and crime, and you had to take time away to do all this. The whole story for us is that, uh, once again, it's something that somebody said, and that's also driven a lot of the attitude towards the rap industry is that the things that they say and the way that they carry themselves has taken it far beyond the criminal activity that may be associated with some of the members. Okay. You wouldn't have to have police policing the rap community if there wasn't violence. Every time you turn around, and I'm not saying in all cases, but you have these problems that just creep up, they just reoccur time after time after again. Whether it's in LA or it's in New York, these problems creep up. So the police departments are gonna pay attention to this. The screwball case is only one scenario in which rap and tell looks suspicious. Uh, the Harlem State Office building is up ahead. We were out here surveilling uh, Farrakhan and Khalid Muhammad. They had a, uh, there was a rally up here for uh, a rally against the police. And there was a problem with uh, Mayor Giuliani, of course. He had a lot of problem with uh, the African-American community. And they had a big rally from here to about maybe four blocks up. And I was walking around with a, a camera sack, <laughs> video and everything. The surveillance, I thought, was kind of like ridiculous in a way. Like, you know, we were up here doing all this different work, and I'm like, this is crazy. I got the industry on lock and key. Who am I? I'm the hip hop police. I could do what I want to do, why can't I? Let a thug get rich, how can I? I'm watching all of you rappers, don't you realize? Let's play a game of charades. Who am I? Uh, this here is uh, Hot 97. There was a shooting here with, uh, between the camps of Little Kim and Foxy Brown. And apparently what happened was that Foxy Brown aligned herself with Capone and Noriega, and Little Kim was with Junior Mafia. The two uh, camps, I guess, saw each other here, and there, were, there was a war of words that were on records already between Foxy and Little Kim. It got out of hand, words were exchanged, and shots were fired. Uh, there were so many shots fired that a lot of people in this area were running for cover. I think it was a woman with a baby carriage who ran to get out of the way, but eventually one of the guys on um, uh, Foxy's side got shot, and uh, this led to a whole big thing. It was a whole big problem for the NYPD because they were very upset about this shooting going down here. But I understand the police were all over that, like uh, flies on uh, cheese. The shooting that happened at Hot 97 was probably the last straw <laughs> between the commissioners and the chiefs with all the smiles going on in the hip-hop world. I was assigned to the Hot 97 radio um, station shooting. Sometime during the investigation, within the next two days, Derek Parker shows up at my squad. It's Vivian Potter, the two detectives from the uh, intel unit, and the chief, the one-star chief. And they were talking to the chief of detectives, telling him that there was a rap war going on, that there was this whole big thing in the rap music industry. This is a big problem, blah, 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 blah. And it really was not. We had made several attempts to speak to people involved in the shooting. Um, the, the person that was shot was on cooperative. And um, people that we wanted to interview, as far as on Little Kim's side, her group, no cooperation whatsoever. We went into One Police Plaza. Before I could get into One Police Plaza, I hear a car going, Derek, come here. It's the police commissioner, Commissioner Carrick. I want these fuckers. I want them. I want to know what happened in this event. I don't care what it takes. They shot, pe shot at people in broad daylight. I want this. I want to know what's going on with this. Stay and do whatever you have to do until it's over. Detective Parker launched a full-fledged surveillance effort, focusing on Lil' Kim. And I had that case done. When that shooting happened, within hours after it was done, I had the whole story and why it happened and who was there. And that was just because I know the streets and I know the people that well. So here we're looking, we're looking at a page about Lil' Kim, and it's got some bio information. It's got a picture of her. It's got a vehicle that's registered in her, in her name, and then also vehicle observed parked at residence, and it gives the license plate number, it gives the type of car, who the owner is, and that person's address. And there's nothing in here, that gives, whether that person is connected to any kind of criminal activity. 
As the investigation progressed, internal conflict began to arise between Detective Parker and Detective Potter. Within my case, I've got a detective who's telling me, uh, oh, I can do this, and I can get that person, and oh, I know, I know her personally. And then nothing comes of it. And he wants you to share your information. Well, what do you have? Well, what do you have so far? And then you just shut up. You gotta remember, I do this stuff every day. This is something that happened in her precinct where she worked at because Hot 97 was based in the 6th precinct. If Hot 97 was in the 6th precinct, Vivian Potter wouldn't be handling this case. It didn't take long before I realized he wasn't doing anything. And, and I'm not saying I held anything from her. I told her basically what the gist of the story was and who the participants were. The most Derek did was leak information to the media. <laughs> That's funny. That's really funny. First of all, I, you got to remember again, I wasn't in New York when this case went down. By the time I got back to New York, it was all over the media. There was certain information that we had found that we didn't want out there. Like, we had video of the incident. You know, sometimes the people didn't know. We know who the players were, but they didn't know we knew that. And then they found out. I couldn't tell you all the people that were involved or say, I mean, I could say who was involved with the investigation, but she has the case folder. So if anything was coming out of her case folder to the press, that was coming from her side of the room and the guys that she was working with. The way things were going, it's just my feeling. There was no one else giving out this information. And I feel also that the people involved on the other side, I feel he was helping them more than he was helping the police department. The only thing they were provided was the uh, information on, like I said, involving nicknames and what the real names of these people were. And we, we sort of, you know, know who all the players were involved in, in um, my shooting. The case eventually became federal. What made the Hot 97 case federal was the people that were involved, the industry, which is the rap music industry, Little Kim lives in New Jersey. The guys that stayed with her stayed in New Jersey and came to New York and committed a crime in New York. Then the other thing was the machine gun that was used. The machine gun was probably brought over from state lines from New Jersey into New York. The district attorney's office couldn't get anywhere, basically. The federal government can do a lot more. And people are afraid of the feds. <laughs> I have to say that. And they got Swift Jackson to, to plead to the gun charge. And that's only because in the federal system, the violence that you've done in the past, the historical violence, can be used against you in federal court. That's why the federal courts, the laws are so much greater and have so much more leverage than the state when you want to go after someone on a case that's heavy duty. Parker's work in the rap unit was generally appreciated, but his association with rappers was drawing suspicion and even jealousy in the traditionally insular. NYPD. This is a bottle I got from uh, Puff Daddy. Sean Combs gave this to me uh, when we had the Steve Stout case. So uh, he gave me a bottle, said thanks. I always kept it. I never opened it. Every day I had to walk a line because you always had somebody in the department always thinking that you were either too close to these people or that, well, hi, this guy might be real close to these rappers. We really don't know what kind of guy he is. Derek had good, very good people skills. But again, there is a little bit of a, uh, uh, a territorialness in some of the uh, good detectives, and they'd rather work these cases themselves than share. Derek had a kick out of himself, and, you know, he, he did like working with the rappers and, and being among them. The uh, thinking in the police department, generally, and this is not one of our strengths, is this idea of you either with us or against us, and there can be no gray. It's definitely a tension between some cops, because some cops, you know, they, they, and that's been proven also, they never knew what side you were on, or they, or they thought that maybe you're doing this industry, where a lot of guys are like, well, this guy's out here doing that, couldn't he go on the other side? 
And I recall being in a meeting with the chief of detectives, and the question came up, listen, these people use drugs, these people do various things that are illegal. Make sure that you do not get involved with these people to that extent. So there's always that concern. On that, we say whether Derek crossed the line or not. You ask, ask yourself the question whether there was a necessary line to cross. Why, can, why do, they, do you perceive that the hip-hop community needs to be diametrically opposed to the police department or vice versa? It doesn't surprise me that Derek, you know, is doing, working security with, um, you know, the rap groups. It's, uh, I guess it's what he was pushing for. And that's why he was you know, so friendly, because there's money to be made there. I'm not close to anybody. I do my job. That's what I'm paid to do. That's what I'm here to do. I don't go out and hang out with Buffy. I don't hang with Busta Rhymes. I'm not with Jay-Z or Fabulous or any of these other guys. Being a black man, he was able to communicate with the black community. And as such, the police never felt totally confident with him because in their mind, perceiving the hip hop community as the enemy, he became one of the enemy. As far as um, Derek's ethnicity as being a black detective, there's no one that I ever became aware of that uh, saw Derek than other than a detective. They never saw him as a black detective, a white detective, anything other than a full-fledged, um, knowledgeable individual to investigate crime. You're in a rough situation, you know, you're a minority and you're a cop and you have a hard time trying to get ahead just being a detective and doing the work that you do or being a boss that you are because there's very few minority bosses on this job. The mounting suspicion about Parker and his rap unit came to a head. I had a really good time in the police department until really my last year. And in my last year, that's when the jealousy really came out. I heard it wasn't a clean break. We recall that he went to, um, I believe, Atlantic City with these people. And as a result, some questions came up as to his integrity. In 2001, Parker traveled to Atlantic City to consult with local police on a rap concert featuring P. Diddy and Busta Rhymes. While there, he met with his brother, a supervisor for the city of New York, and under the auspices of the Atlantic City police, invited him to the concert. Also in town were two NYPD detectives following leads on the Hot 97 case. A music record executive who one of the detectives that was with the sergeant had a picture of him. And he goes, hey, have you seen this guy? And I go, now, smart, being how smart this guy is, the guy he's looking for is standing right next to me and I'm talking with him. The detective came around to me again. I go, you just saw me talking to the guy that you were looking for. That was him? Really? This is what I mean about guys getting into an industry they didn't know nothing about. The two detectives took Parker's behavior as proof of his corruptibility. And that's just what they told their superiors back in New York. By the time I got back to New York, they had made disparaging remarks about me because they said that my brother was acting like he was a cop, and then he did this and that. And I guess I wouldn't share information to them, and then I was close to the rappers. Based on these allegations, the NYPD's Internal Affairs Bureau launched an investigation into Detective Parker. Derek was bounced out of the intelligence unit. That's practically a demotion. It's not a step up. A step up would be to go from a detective squad to the intelligence unit. That was hard, hard, hard wrenching. Never ever been in trouble on a job in my life. Not one command discipline, not one complaint. And for me to go to IAB and make them look stupid. I totally, totally, totally went um, behind Derek and I, I and explained that there was no way he was going to be involved in any sort of corrupt activity. When they find out that Atlantic City is bullshit, the first thing the sergeant goes is like, all right, Atlantic City is water under the bridge. It's a warned and admonished, Derek. It's no big deal. You take a day or two. It's only a command discipline. And ultimately, to my knowledge, all these allegations were proved unfounded. And then ultimately, uh, as a result of the investigation, um, Derek felt that you know the department was not what it was when he came into it. Um, so it was pretty much time he felt that it was time to move on to you know private life. I, I have regrets that I left the job the way I left. I, I I wasn't comfortable with that. I had worked my way up to the ranks. I, I did the right thing. Uh, it took me a while to understand it, but I think I did the right thing. But I, if I had to do it all over again, I would have wanted to leave. Where well, you know I would have a party and. It would have been a happy retirement party, whatever. I don't think, I think the way I left was, was abrupt. It was different. 
But I knew I had to do it for those reasons. The police did a car stop and stopped Derek one day. Derek was downtown, and he was coming out of the studio. And they said, hey, who are you? Derek showed him his ID. And Derek said, hey, I'm retired. They said, hey, that's good for you. Derek Parker has moved on since his retirement, working as a private investigator and running security for rappers. But his departure didn't bring an end to the rap unit. The police department's stance on this is that that's not true. They, they say that there isn't a new guy. Yeah, there is. There's two guys doing it. The one guy who took my spot, he's a good guy. You know, I mean, we verified they're out there and, you know, they're, they're doing the same job. But they're just, they're a little more, uh, they're a little less known, well known than, than Derek was. Big Rosie? Big Rosie took over? Yeah, Rosie. <laughs> <laughs> There's further proof that Rap and Tell is still in effect. Just take a look inside the binder. There's more NYPD documents in here since his retirement, since in the last two years. Um, and so, I mean, it would appear to me that the NYPD is continuing. Sent 12903. I wasn't on the department 12903. Whenever you go into a computer, it has a date. And on the date, it indicates the time 22203. Derek Parker was not on the police department, 22203. So whoever did this, whoever put this together, did it afterwards. Of particular interest are the arrest files that Parker says were added to the binder after his retirement and bear an HIDTA stamp. What does that mean, HIDTA? It's HIDTA, which is a multi-agency task force. And it's a high-intensity drug trafficking area. Basically, it's just a drug task force. What we found uh, that stood out most to me out of all the things that were in here was the seal on these that showed that a federal agency was also involved in compiling this information. There is some source of federal funding that's being spent on this and that this federal funding is being directed through the office of the president. Haida is just a clearinghouse for information. Haida just does a lot of, they have all the computers and all the informational systems at their disposal that they can do things on. So a lot of the pet members of the NYPD would go to Haida just to make out these different reports because Haida would have access to computers. The Haida stamp seems to suggest that the unit has broadened its scope beyond the NYPD's jurisdiction and may now involve federal agencies. The thing that seems to be tying it all together is this, is this federal seal, but that could be the umbrella that brings a lot of different jurisdictions together to deal with the issue. The Fed, I know the feds are doing this at the same time. The feds have a, a joint task force going on right now. Proof that federal agencies are investigating rappers came in January 2005, when the FBI staged a press conference to announce the arrest of Irv and Chris Gotti, founders of the music label Murder, Inc., on money laundering charges. This book opens up with Eric yeah. Gotti. Uh, Did I say McGriff? And then it goes to Kenneth McGriff. Right. Did Kenneth McGriff that? is one of the founding fathers of the crack industry. This um, murder ink investigation with the feds started with Kenneth McGriff, who's a drug dealer from Queens. Uh, the feds looked into the, his involvement with several murders that were here and out of state, and then his involvement with murder ink. I know Chris, I know Irv Gotti, and I don't really think Chris and Irv Gotti are bad guys. The feds are saying is that Kenneth McGriff provided drug money and funded their company. That's gonna be something that they're gonna have to prove. There are people, executives in the music industry, uh, who've been questioned, specifically I talked to, by the federal investigators. But apparently, the, this investigation is broad ranging. Looking at the financing of these record companies, looking at people, personalities, and the entourages surrounding many of these artists. They're looking at violence in the hip hop music industry. They're also looking into rap artists as victims of extortion. The, the feds made a very public arrest because they wanted it to be known in the papers, and I guess they're trying to send the message for everybody to know that they're around. And they're looking into the rap industry just like anybody else is. Preemption, that seems to be the big phrase that's kicked around these days. What if this is a preemptive strike against these very, very magnetic people who have caught the ears of an entire generation that nobody could reach out to? Though some of this may be warranted, there is, I think, a concern that the feds may get too zealous here, that they may use the example of clearly some bad elements as 
representative of the industry. Just get in the crosshairs. Just get to where they decide out of everybody they want you. And once you hit that crosshair and your name goes up on one of them bulletin board, and they tend to send five agents or 10 agents after your ass, your life is gonna change, partner. It's gonna be some different shit for you. And you wanna talk about rights? And you lost your motherfucking mind. This is the United States of America. And go talk to Indians about rights. My intelligence tells me there's a lot of things going on. And a lot of things are gonna be coming down very shortly within the community. And, um, what do you mean? I can't tell you. How does the hit the seal end up on these? When you see this hide a seal, and it says New York, New Jersey, hide a mug, mug shot profile, someone went to the computer and used the hide a computer to do these photographs. Doesn't this really take it up to a higher level that there was really cooperation of course, from of federal agents, agencies in doing this? You remember some of the rap violence that happened bordered on the federal government coming in to investigate. When you bring the government in, then it's a different story. Okay. Because it involves the government taking action in a situation where they don't have any suspicion of the person that they would be taking action for. I know what you're saying, like, well, you guys go over the line to get the information, and then it's like you're doing A, B, C, and D. But I think if we had gathered information before 9-11, there would be no 9-11. But if you gather information the way that you're talking about gathering it of people who aren't suspicious, then there's there's no country to protect. But that's there's, that, there's but, no more there's no more. But that's your interpretation USA. that they're not suspicious. That's your interpretation. Well, we're gonna go around and around about that because it's, it's clear <laughs> right, you all, you you all see it a, diff a different way than we do. Right. And especially when you look at the history of what happens when when these things start to shift from just suspicion into well, let's just keep information on everybody in the industry and let's collect it and gather it up everywhere then it is a form of surveillance without suspicion, and that's where we have the problem. The ACLU hopes to take legal action against the rap unit and the binder, but rappers aren't exactly lining up to help them out. Yo, they watching us, dog. That's all you just gotta live with it. I mean, what you gonna do? What you gotta understand is where I'm from, like going to court and suing people, is not considered very strong. Me, I stay away from the cops. I just, if I'm riding, I see it, I ride the other way. Is that normal? Is that supposed to happen? If you're going you to arrest me or whatever, then do it. You know what I'm saying? But don't be following me and my mans and them in the car. I mean, the reason I ain't filing a complaint, because, you know, that's not what I do. I don't go around, like, filing complaints on police. That's not what I do. We never had the right to say anything anyway, so all this shit don't really bother me. It's just intelligence. That's what they want to do. Let, let them put it together. It's life, man. It's life. You got to just adapt to it. That's it. I adapt to it. I could care less about the hip hop task force. I, I don't fuck with that. Like, seriously. Like, I don't fuck with no hip hop cops. I don't fuck with that whole shit. Nobody really wants to go through the hassle of it. The, the uh, we don't believe you of it. So usually we don't, but that's what's really happening. It's a double-edged sword because you speak out. Now you got to worry about, all right, now these niggas got to bust my chops. I fought one of the biggest free speech laws in American history, and I learned, man, you have no free speech. So a black man that thinks he has rights, good luck. You know, in some ways, the hip-hop community benefits from this. They have to appear, or they have benefited from appearing notorious. I must be popular. I must be doing something right if I'm in the book. That must mean I'm making some kind of money. I'm not doing nothing. You know what I'm saying? Cool. Toast to y'all. Recognizing I got cake. Holla back. Oh, you thought I think a lot of cats would like to be in that book? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm sure a lot of little busters would like to be on some police file so they could think they tough and this, that, and the third. That's an interesting one. Uh, as far as publicity, sure, it's publicity. It's notorious publicity. But I'm sure that people are feeling a little uneasy about every time they step out the door, you know, who might be snapping their picture or following them. You need to stand up now rather than ask us to stand up for you after you become a victim of this. You can't avoid a conspiracy. You can only confront it. With rappers unwilling to confront the NYPD, the issue of the rap unit's activity seems to be dormant. Regardless, the NYPD is supposedly anxious about Derek Parker and his rising profile. My source was telling me there was a new rap intel guy and who he was and that it's continuing. Also said that, you know, the police department does 
keep tabs on Derek. I wouldn't be surprised if they had guys following me. Feds, you know, FBI guys. But I know those tricks, too. I know how to lose them. <laughs> I think there is a feeling among, you know, some people in the NYPD that, you know, that he can't be trusted anymore. There's the sense that uh, Derek may have switched allegiances, which I really, truly, I hope is not the truth. And uh, I don't think it is the truth. You know, at this time, I have authorized documents in my possession that I can't release just yet because I don't know if they're really official police documents. I, I know they're official police documents. I don't know if I have authorization to release them because they may not be approved just yet or I may have to need them at a later date. Parker, meanwhile, has gotten plenty of media attention, which has earned him plenty of haters. My thing is that this particular cop that started this has made himself famous. And that's what you got to remember. You, you just mentioned his name. You didn't mention anybody else from New York Police Department. You mentioned his name. This tape is going to make him famous. He'll be the one going into politics, not us. He'll parlay this to something bigger. You know what I'm saying? So you got to think about that. You guys are making him what he wants. I'm sure uh, he's going to try to do movies and books and interviews and so forth uh, and increase his own profile off of this. Parker is outside the NYPD now, but his current work keeps him inside the same rap world he once policed. We got a lot of parties coming up this week. Any events going on? It's not about just doing security. I do the private investigation. I kind of really like the intricate things to do. I don't like the, the simple stuff. I like some of the hard, complex jobs that deal with attorneys and, you know, figuring out things, because I'm good at that. This is my newspaper article booklet. And what I do here is I keep information as far as uh, newspapers are concerned, if anything has to do with the rap industry. Yeah, I'm not in a job anymore, but I still keep abreast of what goes on, even for the for what I do now, because I'm in the security private investigation business. Here's a case I was involved in with Jam Master J. Mom's graveside, graveside vow. You know, the mother is upset, and she wants to kill a court in her son's death. When Jam Master J was killed, I was probably notified within 30 minutes or 40 minutes after his murder. I had called up and spoke with a detective, um, Bernie Porter, who worked in the squad, and told him if he needed my help to call me. Well, they didn't call. I guess they really felt that they didn't need my help. But they had a multitude of problems with the case. I was called by another rapper who asked me to get involved in this case. He says a favor to me, this is what's going on. And not only did this rapper call me, but another entertainment guy called me and said, these guys are going to screw this case up unless you come on board. I just, I wish that the police were better at doing this thing, but I know this is a, this is a lot of, it's very political, and I think right now the feds are looking at this investigation. But while some members of the NYPD view Parker with suspicion, plenty of his old friends in the department still hit him up for help. This is a place where uh, shooting just happened a couple weeks ago, about two weeks ago, with um, a party that Ja Rule was hosting. Apparently what happens is that at the end of the night, two guys come out, they're the party goers from the party, they confront another guy, there's some words exchanged, and then shots are fired, leaving one guy dead and another guy injured. Uh, the next day, the police department had it as uh, there's a weak beat between Ja Rule and 50. Those facts are just theories and accurate theories right now, and the cops are going on. Detective McCormie Cornetta, he's a good friend of mine from Brooklyn. He and I know each other very well, and he doesn't know the rap music industry that well. So he said, look, you're pretty much the guy who knows all of this stuff, and you're out here all the time. And he asked me if I could help him out. I, I try to get out, and they keep pulling me back in. They out of trouble. You know? Um, stop following me. We're not following you. We're not following you. That's what's up. Now you follow me. I think things that you should do to prevent a situation if you get by stop by a cop, make sure that be polite. And being polite, I mean giving his license and registration. Cooperate. Cooperation sometimes is the best thing in a Seat belts. <laughs> Throw my seatbelt on. Precautionary shit. I don't carry guns. Don't bring any weapons. Do not 
under any circumstances consent to anything else. I don't drive. <laughs> I don't go outside. <laughs> when somebody gets pulled over, they realize that they have a right to remain silent. I just start rolling the cameras. Like my driver got a camera. Run that camera just so they don't do nothing that they ain't supposed to be doing. I, I pay my parking ticket. I, 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 I have reg my, pay my registration. Travel with somebody who's legitimate, mm -hmm. security. Like, they can just have you sitting there for two hours bullshit with you just to see if they can get you frustrated. You know, it's happened to me. I say, no disrespect, but you know I don't have to answer that question. Yeah, you just can't ride with them things on you, you know? Just don't be dirty. You know that little weed smell is gonna let them go in your trunk, which gonna let them go in your shit, which gonna let, you know, follow what I'm saying? The officer will ask, can I search your car? He's no right to search your car. We don't advise people to block the search of the vehicle, but to say over and over again, I do not give you consent. My advice to any artists that are attacked or pulled over by the police, if you have means, I'll sue them. Sue the city.